Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered, once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Good, uh, oh, there we go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see your faces if you're online. Great to see you too. Uh, I want to begin uh, by praying, and I'm going to pray this morning that uh, everything that is said would lift up the name of Jesus Christ, and that he only, we've been worshipping our God and, and the Lord Jesus, his Son, our Saviour today, uh, welcoming the Holy Spirit, and I want to pray that my part now as we come to God's Word is a continuation of that. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we come into your presence today and we are thankful for this opportunity to gather in this place, uh, to gather, to leave in one sense uh, the, the, the lives that we, we uh, pursue during the week and the challenges and the troubles and to come in a, in, a, in a focused way to lift our eyes up to you. And Lord, we pray that this would happen now, that the Lord Jesus would be enthroned in our hearts and that everything that we do in these next moments as we, as we lift his word and then we continue to sing, everything would point to and lift up and magnify the name of this Lord Jesus in whose name we pray and God's people said with a loud voice, Amen, Amen, because that's a good prayer to pray. Now, uh, we as a family have a bit of a, a tradition of family movie night, right? It's not that regular, but we have a family movie night. A couple of weeks ago now, we saw a movie called Greater. Has anyone else seen that movie? No, just me. Well, some of you have got a treat to have in front of you because it's the true story of a guy called Brandon Burlsworth. Uh, Brandon was a young kid who had a big dream to play American NFL football. But he had some problems. In fact, he had lots of problems. He was very fat. Uh, he was unfit. He came from a broken home, he suffered a severe case of OCD, and on top of that, he was a committed Christian, and all of that combined together to make him an object of mockery. People laughed at him, uh, they, dis they scorned him. But Brandon Burlsworth worked harder and longer than anybody else. He suffered physically. Uh, he, he put himself through hell in one sense. He worked harder and longer than anybody else. And his story becomes perhaps the greatest story of perseverance ever in American football in all time. Because in 1999, he was indeed drafted into the NFL by the Indianapolis Colts. All his suffering paid off. 11 days after being drafted, he was killed in a car accident. What did all that suffering actually achieve? How can that suffering be anything but meaningless? For Albert Schweitzer, who's a doctor, theologian, 
Jesus' suffering was simply that. It was meaningless. It was a result of naivety. Jesus came and lived on our earth thinking that he was someone that he was not. And when suffering came for Jesus, it was just simply that he failed to see it coming. He wrote this. Listen to how he puts it. There is silence all around. The Baptist appears and cries, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Soon after that comes Jesus, and in the knowledge that he is the coming Son of Man, he lays hold of the wheel of fate to set it moving on that last revolution, which is to bring all ordinary history to a close. It refuses to turn, and so he throws himself upon it. Then it does turn, and it crushes him. The wheel rolls onward and the mangled body of the one immeasurably great man who is strong enough to think of himself as the spiritual ruler of mankind and to bend history to his purpose is hanging upon it. He hangs upon it still. That is his victory and his reign. Well, Peter's readers are suffering. Peter has told them that their suffering is not an accident. In fact, it's not incidental to their identity as Christians. It's right at the heart of it. To this you've been called, he says. Uh, He's called his readers in the earlier chapters to submit to government authorities, all human institutions and authorities, he says, whether it's the government or whether it's employers, whether it's within marriage. But that's not all that Peter has to say about suffering. Uh, Today, in these verses of 1 Peter, Peter addresses suffering from a different angle. He looks at it through a different lens. And once again, he points these small suffering churches to the only thing that will help them in their suffering, the only thing that can sustain them in it. He points them unashamedly and completely and entirely to Jesus Christ. But as he does so, he comes from a different lens. Today, we will not focus so much as Jesus is our example of suffering, as the example of Jesus on how we should suffer when we suffer, as we look to him and try to do what he did. This morning, he points to Jesus, the suffering more, I think more, even more wonderfully and more graciously and more gloriously, he points to Jesus as the victor. And this morning we're going to see three things which I believe will transform our suffering if we will let them. Three things. We're going to see Jesus Christ as Lord. And we're going to see, secondly, Jesus Christ as living. And thirdly, we're going to see Jesus Christ as conqueror. So three things this morning, which I think a different lens, which if we'll allow, will transform our suffering. Number one, Jesus Christ is Lord. We see that in verse 3. This is what it says. Now, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? Now, Peter is not saying, if you do the right thing, no one will harm you, right? Because if if he suddenly says that, it just undermines everything else he's been saying in the last two chapters of his letter. He's speaking about Christians suffering unjustly. Now, what he's saying is, if you're zealous for doing what is good... Even if you should suffer for it, you'll be blessed. Blessed now, but more importantly, blessed on that final day when no one can hurt you. So he says in verse 14 these words, and I want to I drill down into them. These are wonderful words. He says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Peter's uh, quoting from the Old Testament here. He's quoting uh, from the book of Isaiah, which actually we happened to go through this last year. It comes from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 12. This is what Isaiah said long ago. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear. 
nor be in dread, but the Lord of hosts, him you shall honour as holy. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Peter is taking a verse from Isaiah, which was written in its original context to the people of Israel, God's people, when they were enduring an invasion from the north, a military invasion. He's writing to them maybe in a little bit similar to what Ukraine is experiencing at the moment. Armies were pushing into their territory and there was great fear. And that was the original context. Peter quotes from that and he applies it to these little suffering churches and these suffering Christians and he says the same thing except in verse 15 in the original it said you shall set apart the Lord of hosts that's Yahweh Shavuot in Hebrew it's it's the God of armies Yahweh him you shall see as holy don't fear these things and Peter lifts it out and he says and verse 15 but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy Other translations say, reverence Christ in your heart. Set aside Christ as Lord in your hearts. But the question is, well, what does it do to our suffering to set aside Christ as Lord in our hearts? If we could ask Peter himself, I think Peter would tell us it's got everything to do with suffering. Think uh, for a moment Create in your minds the image that we will look at over Easter, probably, of Peter in the courtyard of the high priest. I think we've got a a slide here, perhaps, of Rembrandt's uh, image of that. Peter said he was a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter said he'd die for Jesus. And yet, in the courtyard of the high priest, as Rembrandt depicts it, we see Peter challenged by those around, and particularly a servant girl. And Peter, who said he followed Jesus with everything, is overwhelmed by fear and anxiety and terror. Three times he betrays Jesus. And here in this scene, you can see in the background, perhaps, Jesus looking across at Peter as he makes that third and final denial. But then consider Peter standing only a few weeks later before the same court, right, that condemned Jesus to a horrific death, standing before the same court and boldly declaring to them, you murdered Jesus, guys. You can read it in the Gospels. You murdered him, but he rose from the dead. And they say to him, you be quiet or you will die like he did. And he says, you can stick it in a nice way. He says, you can beat me if you like, and they do but I will not speaking of the, uh, stop speaking about the truth of Jesus Christ. What's the difference? Peter has now set Jesus Christ as Lord in his heart. He's transformed. The reality of suffering is still there, but Peter sees it through a different lens. He knows that even though these court and these authorities have the power to harm him, and they will, and they do, in reality, they cannot harm what really matters. They can make him suffer, they can hurt him, but they cannot destroy his eternal security. And in the end, they will just cause him to be blessed. Jesus is Lord of his heart. And because he's Lord of his heart, because he reverences Jesus Christ as Lord, there's nothing that suffering can bring that can harm that. There's nothing to fear. Well, what about you? What about you personally as you relate to suffering how do you respond to suffering how do you respond when something doesn't work out as you thought it should have how do you respond to those times when when life seems to be turned upside down how do you respond to those times when you feel that you're backed into the corner by no fault of your own how do you respond and what might Having Christ in your Lord as your heart changed the way you see that. There's been a lot of fear in the last few years, hasn't there? A lot of fear of suffering and what it might do. Fear of conspiracy theories. Fear of the suppression bill and the persecution that may flow from that. Fear of COVID-19 and fear of COVID-19 vaccines. There's been fear of government control, fear, fear of economic damage. And if that wasn't enough... 
then let's add the fear that I thought had gone away since I was a little kid, the fear of a potential nuclear holocaust. That's back. Fear has been everywhere. And this, the reasons for this fear may well be genuine. This is not some kind of Christian toxic optimism, right? I've met Christians that go like, I'm a Christian now and my life's going to be sweet. And I'm like, you haven't been a Christian very long or you're just being dishonest. Because that's not how it works. Never is it promised that Christians are somehow toxically optimistic about everything. Suffering is real. Suffering is out there. And Peter's been saying to those first Christians, you're going to experience it sooner or later. Every one of you. And I'd say to you this morning, if you were one of these people, and if you've got gray hair, I, am, I don't know how you did this, but you've lived a whole life without suffering, tell me your secret. But if anyone says, oh, no, I'm a, I'm a Christian now, and Jesus has taken all my suffering, I don't experience it, I'd love to talk to you maybe in five years' time and see if that's still true. It's not. Suffering is real. And Peter's message to us as Christians is not that it's never going to come, but that when it does come, Jesus Christ is still Lord of our hearts. And if you set aside the Lord Jesus as Lord in your heart, suffering cannot touch you. It can touch you physically. It can even take your life, but it can't touch really what's important. Because Jesus Christ is still Lord, whether you suffer or whether you don't. That's one reason that we, we sing and we set aside Christ as Lord to remind ourselves He is Lord. That's the first thing. The first different lens as we look at, Jesus Christ is Lord. Set set aside him in your heart as Lord. Reverence him. Now, secondly, as you suffer, Peter says, remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Verse 15. This follows on immediately from what uh, Peter's just said. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Peter says, as we set apart Jesus Christ as Lord in our hearts, as we reverence him, we need to be prepared to give to everyone who asks us a reason for the hope that we have. Now, this verse can be quite Scary, can't it? We hear Peter say, in giving a reason, uh, the word in Greek is apologia. Um, It's the word from which we get apology, obviously, but it doesn't mean that we are providing an apology like, oh, it's very saying sorry about this, sorry. No, actually, in the Greek use, it's saying give a defense. It's give a a reasoned explanation for the hope that you have. And when we hear that, most of us go, oh, no. Oh, no, I I can't give a reasoned defense because someone's going to ask me about quantum physics. I don't know about quantum physics. Someone's going to ask me about detailed, I don't know, evolutionary uh, theories that apparently disprove the existence of God. They're going to talk about gender. They're going to talk about homosexuality. They're going to talk about a whole lot of things that why they say they can't believe Jesus. And I'm not an expert in all those things. So I couldn't really give an answer for the reason for the hope that I have. But... Let's ask, what is the hope that we have, right? Firstly, what is the hope? Well, Peter has not left us guessing. He's already told us multiple times what the hope that we have is. Listen again, way back at chapter 1, as he's beginning his letter, verse 3, this is what Peter says about the hope that we have. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again, listen to this, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope, first and foremost, is based on the fact that Jesus Christ is alive. He was raised from the dead. That, if you're a Christian this morning, that is your hope. Fundamentally, your hope is based on the fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, that he's alive. If he's still hanging dead on the wheel of fate, like Albert Schweitzer believed, you have no hope in suffering. Your suffering is meaningless. If Jesus hung on that wheel and is slowly turning around and round and round, suffering's just meaningless 
things happening to you in a meaningless universe where God really doesn't exist or not is in control. But if you're a Christian, your hope is based on the fact that Jesus Christ suffered and is alive. Listen how Peter puts it in verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. You know what Peter is saying here? He's speaking about Jesus suffering in our place and dying on the cross for our sins, as he has done many times already in this letter to, of First Peter. This is what uh, we call in theological language the substitutionary atonement. Jesus substitutes into our place. He dies for our sin on the cross. He is put to death. But Peter doesn't stop there. His focus there, he's put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. This is our hope in suffering. Jesus is alive. Now, um, I am way more knowledgeable about Christian apologetics than I was when I was a new believer. When I was a new believer, I was 17, I really didn't have any idea about the kind of the big issues of the Christian faith. Uh, I didn't have a big, I didn't have convincing answers to anyone who might ask me. Since then, I've gone to Bible college, I've done a subject on apologetics, I've written essays. I know a whole lot more about Christian apologetics, but I'll tell you something, never has my reason for the hope that I have been more compelling than when I was a, a new Christian. Why is that? I've got all this extra information, but my, my actual day-to-day -day interactions with people when they ask me for the hope that I have was much more powerful then. I'll tell you why. Uh, there was an old uh, Hillsong chorus in the early 90s. Uh, it was, it, I don't think it was a great, from a great song, but it was, it was a good, good words. It said this, very theologically profound. Death could not hold him down. He is alive right? That was, that was the kind of over and over chorus thing. But in my mind, that song would, would, would go around my mind, it would sit in my heart, and as I would be peeking, like over and over in those years, I would say, death couldn't hold him down. He's alive. And I hope I shared it respectfully, as Peter says. I hope I, I shared it in a way that was gentle, as Peter tells us to. But when someone says, Andrew, what's the reason for the hope that you have? like, Jesus is alive. He, he's alive. And that changed everything for me. And I'd just chat and talk with people and, and, and they'd have all these big questions. I'm like, look, I don't, I don't really know the answers to those big questions, but I do know Jesus is alive. How do you know that? Because I've experienced it. Yes, I've looked at the evidence, but I've, I've experienced the fact that Jesus is alive. And there was, there was one wonderful occasion I lived next to a Buddhist guy, right? And he used to bug me. He'd bug me over and over about all these questions about nirvana and stuff. I had no idea. I had no idea what Buddhists believed at that point. And, and he'd talk to me about these things and, and he'd come in and I used to, sometimes I used to pretend I wasn't in my room when he'd knock because like, I just don't want another long detailed discussion about something that I can't answer right now. And then one Easter, he came back and he said, I've become a Christian. I was like, you what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'm a Christian. And how did that happen? And he said, well, I I just suddenly looked at the evidence of the resurrection and, and you've been speaking to me all this time and I'm feeling guilty. Uh, well, yeah, and, and I've become a Christian. That guy's in ministry today. And it wasn't because I answered all his incredible apologetic arguments. It was because I was speaking to him about the hope that I had in Jesus Christ. Others were speaking to him and he was, he was reading and investigating. God was working in his heart. I couldn't see it. And my part was simply to share the hope of Jesus Christ resurrected. Now, let me tell you something, every single Christian can do that. You may not have all the answers. No one does. There are really good and deep and difficult questions which people ask, and there are people out there who do have very compelling ways of, of thinking these things, things through. You might not be that, but if you're a Christian, you know that Jesus is alive, and you can share that truth, and I think that's actually all that Peter's asking you to do. Give a reason for the hope that you have. And your hope is that Jesus is indeed alive. But what happens when that living hope burns low? What happens when you, you struggle to feel the reality of that hope? What happens then? Um, a few years ago, I remember walking 
uh, with a non-Christian guy who had lots of questions about the Christian faith. And you know, I, I didn't feel there was any questions I hadn't heard before. Uh, but then we got to suffering. And he said, well, Andrew, how do you personally deal with suffering? And, and I was talking about that, that very question of suffering, and, and I was tempted to go like, Jesus is alive, I've got hope, and, and I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm pushing forward in that hope, and Jesus Christ is alive, and, and that's, that's how I handle suffering. But in that moment, I was struggling. And, and I said to him this, I said like, look, I don't doubt that Jesus is alive, that God is God, but right now I do doubt if he's good. And you might say, what a terrible witness for a pastor to make but I was being honest that it was true I did I didn't doubt God existed and Jesus was alive but I doubted that he was being good to me right then now I'm not encouraging you to to share your faith in that way that that's not I don't think a compelling presentation of the wonderful beauty and relevance and truth of Jesus Christ in the gospel but I do think that we need to be honest And we need to to share what's really going on. But that said, we shouldn't stay there. And if your hope is burned low, and if you think, I can't be bothered telling anybody in my workplace or my family, they ask me about the hope that I have, and I kind of dodge the question, I don't really want to go there. If that is you, you shouldn't stay there. God doesn't want you to stay there. Christians are a hope-filled people, and it's based on the fact that Jesus is alive. That's where we must end up over and over again. So what's the solution? John Piper, he puts it like this in talking about this passage. We go to the Word because we are so desperately needy. Get an amen for that. Our own hope wanes. We have fears that need to be overcome by the promises of God. We have doubts that need to be answered. The fight of faith is waged on our knees with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, and prayer. What Piper is saying, when our own hope wanes, we don't try and manufacture something. You know, We don't just try and get a bit of an emotion happening. We get on our knees and we fight with the weapons that God has given us the weapons of our hope, the word, prayer, worship together. We, we, might, we might add some of the Christian disciplines like fasting, like pressing in, in, in concentrated study. We do those things and we do them not to try and manufacture a feeling. We do them because we want to encounter again the living power of the resurrected Christ coming down into our lives, setting us on fire again. So that when someone asks, what's the reason for the hope that you have We say, I have a sure hope in Jesus Christ, and this is my reasons for it. See what I'm saying? So if this morning you you, you struggle with that, don't be depressed, don't give up. Press once again to the only one who is your hope and can again ignite the embers of your heart, Jesus Christ, and him crucified, and Peter says, resurrected. Jesus Christ is not only Lord, Jesus Christ is alive. Now, thirdly and finally, Jesus Christ has conquered. He's conquered. Now, the, these next verses that in, in, uh, in Peter's letter are notoriously difficult to understand. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, the great theologian, commentator, all-round good guy, he said of these verses, a wonderful text is this, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, so that I don't really know for a certainty just what Peter means. Now, Martin Luther may have struggled, but I've got good news for you, church. Your gospel community leader has all of the answers. And so this week, as you go to gospel community, you make sure you put them on the spot. They've got the answers that you need. But look, let's read it. Because Peter wrote it, in the, he wrote it to suffering Christians, he wrote it because they needed it, and just because some of the details are obscure, and they are, it doesn't mean that the big message is not clear, because it is. So let's look at these verses together in verse 18. This is what Peter says. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, now this, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison 
because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. So the questions that we want to ask is, so hang on, where did Jesus go? When did he go? And who did he preach to? So basically we're asking questions about that, which are pretty substantial questions. And the answer is, no one really knows on any of those three questions for sure. There are many, many different ideas about what Peter means. Um, One of the exclamations, which could well be true, is that Peter's saying that Jesus, when he was raised, he, he went back and he preached to the spirits of the people who were in prison awaiting the final judgment because they refused to listen to God's goodness through Noah. That, that's one possibility. But I think the best explanation uh, comes by using the Bible itself, and particularly going back to Genesis, where, uh, where God speaks about the days of Noah specifically. And this is what it says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. And get ready, because this is also not the easiest of verses. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. Now, these sons of God, who are they? Uh, they're having human, they're, they're coming down with earth women, having children from them. Who are they? Well, most likely they're evil supernatural beings. Good angels who had rebelled, become demonic, become demons, and in some way, they are coming together with women and having offspring. In the time of Jesus, most Jewish theologians believe that such was an incredibly great crime that these supernatural beings had committed in polluting, corrupting the human race. Such was the extent of that crime that they were judged with a specific judgment by God, that they were held in a a prison awaiting the final destruction in that time. And if that is true, that when Jesus dies and he's resurrected, he goes to preach to these spirits, these demonic forces, not like a message of repent and believe the gospel, but a proclamation of judgment, a proclamation of his victory. You tried to destroy the human race. I've I have saved it. So here is your judgment. Now, the good news is, it doesn't really matter which of those views it could be. The Bible doesn't leave us hanging on obscure points. It asks us to wrestle with the text, but the big picture is clear, and we'll we'll come back to that in a moment. But before we do, there's another difficult part of this passage to understand, and it's this. Verse 21. Baptism, which corresponds to this, what he's just said, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter's point is that what happened in the flood is what has happened to us when we were baptized. In the flood of Noah, think about it, still with me, In the flood of Noah, God's judgment against a sinful world is poured out by an overwhelming deluge of water, killing everyone except eight people who were saved in the ark. And God's made an ark for us too. The waters of death and judgment came and broke on our ark, on Jesus Christ, on the cross the waters of judgment poured onto Jesus and then in the tomb they poured over Jesus. But in baptism, when we are united into his death and and early Christian church baptism was in the waters, it was full immersion as you were immersed in that water. You were joined together with Christ as the waters of God's judgment poured out over him. And then you weren't left there because Jesus Christ was raised after bearing our sins. And Peter's point is, if you are united with Christ, you are buried in his death and you are raised again in his life. The ark has saved you. Jesus Christ has saved you. We're united with him. And we come from the waters of baptism, cleansed cleansed and saved, proclaiming to the world the reality that Jesus Christ has saved us from sin and death and 
judgment. Baptism is a big deal, which is why if you haven't been baptized, you should be. And there's an opportunity this Easter. But as I said, this is not the main point. The fact that Jesus preaches to spirits in prison, uh, the fact that baptism is so significant are actually not the main points. The main point is that Jesus Christ is Lord of all and he has conquered. That is the main point. If you read through this text, you'll see how it ends in verse 22. Jesus has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers having been subjected to him. Did you hear that? Jesus Christ has conquered. Uh, If you've been journeying through this letter with 1 Peter, you'll know that word be subject to has come up a lot. Be subject to. Uh, Peter's been saying, Christians, be subject to the political authorities. Be subject to your bosses. Be subject to within your family relationship of marriage. Now, Peter says, all authorities in heaven on earth, supernatural authorities are subject to Jesus Christ who has conquered. Do you get the idea? Jesus stands like a general on the battlefield who has conquered everything. He looks at it, he surveys all of his triumph and he sees suffering there cowering, cowering, chained. And he sees suffering there and he allows it to go on its chain for a little while, but only to impact his people in a way that will test them and refine them and bring them more glory in the end. Suffering is there awaiting the final judgment, the final kick, the final extinction. Jesus Christ has conquered Hear those words, verse 22 again. He's gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subject to him. If you're suffering, Christian, your and my final hope is that Jesus Christ is not just dead, he's not just raised, he is conquered, and he has conquered, and he will conquer, and eventually all things will indeed be subject to him. Do you hear that if you suffer this morning? Jesus Christ has conquered well, let me conclude at the end of the day we don't have easy answers about suffering I don't have any easy answers for why God allowed Brendan Burlsworth to go through all that only to be taken like that in a car accident I don't understand why I suffer sometimes I do it's my fault other times I don't understand and, and you'll be the same you, We don't understand. We don't have all the answers. But I'll tell you something, and I'll close with this. Albert Schweitzer was wrong. Jesus Christ doesn't hang on the wheel of fate as it turns and turns, and that suffering is therefore meaningless. It happens. It's naive to think that it's anything but meaningless. Jesus Christ hung on the wheel of fate on the cross, and as that wheel turned, he was raised again to life, and his promise is that he will smash that wheel forever. He is Lord. He is risen. He is the one who conquered. Musicians, if you could come up, we're going to close out our time by by singing again. And what we are doing when we sing is we are telling, we're setting apart Christ as Lord in our hearts. But while the musicians are coming up and before I pray, I want us to to close, everyone just do it now, close your eyes just for a moment. And while everyone's eyes are closed, If right at this moment you are struggling with suffering and you don't understand why it's happening and you're wrestling to to have the hope in your heart in Jesus' resurrection, just while we're all quiet, while the musicians are setting up, I want you to put up your hand because I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God would resurrect and reunite your hope. So right now, if that is you, just give me a wave and I will see and pray for you. That's all I will do. Oh, bless you guys. Anyone else? Yeah. There's a few of us. I saw you. Okay, pop those hands down. I want to pray for you. Father, we live in a world where it doesn't always go the way we want. We live in a world where there's so much suffering and there's so much fear. But Lord, we come this morning and we proclaim as we look at Jesus Christ, Lord, we proclaim his lordship over the hearts of these people that feel that so much right now. Lord, we proclaim over their hearts the fact that Jesus Christ is not dead, he's alive. 
And Lord, we pray that in your mercy, the risen, resurrected Jesus would come to those who are hurting in our church this morning, would come and walk alongside them, reignite their faith. And Father, we thank you that you've conquered Jesus Christ, that you have conquered all. And we pray for those brothers and sisters that they would know the truth that nothing, no one can stand between them and your love, that you have conquered, that suffering cannot stand in between the conquering, resurrected Jesus. So we pray for this, Lord. We pray for the sweet comfort and blessing and empowering of God for these brothers and sisters who are hurting. And for all of us. And we ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.